Hey guys, welcome to the Professional Development Podcast. Today is Wednesday, March 24th, and we've got on a very special guest, and that's Jordan Harbinger. So Jordan went from corporate grind, uh, Wall Street lawyer, to interviewing people like Kobe Bryant, Malcolm Gladwell, and Mark Cuban, and that's just the tip. He went from that to getting over 11 million downloads per month on his show, the Jordan Harbinger Podcast. Jordan, thanks so much for being on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. You guys are, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be kind of some silly fun. Absolutely. Uh, and so before we get started, I actually have to say, so I know I reached out to you on, and I think your your wife handles the social media, so she probably has a better That's idea, right. but reached out on every possible platform, like slide slid into every DM to try to get you on. Uh, but at one point you actually cold called me when I was listening, I guess, just getting my like self-development start. Uh, I started listening to the art of charm mm. and it's when you guys had those weekend workshops or whatever it was. Right. And I filled out a form uh, and then got a call and you were like, Hey man, it's Jordan Harbinger from the art of charm podcast. And I was like, Holy shit. And so we talked for like five to 10 minutes about it. But unfortunately I was way too broken and too much debt at the time to come wow. out. So that's all good. I would not recommend it now. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I stopped working with them a couple of years ago. Yeah. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And, and we might dig into that a little bit later, but again, appreciate you coming on. Um, another question, you, you obviously interview some of the most successful people in the world for a living. Is it ever weird being on the other side? And do you ever find yourself just completely like picking apart the other people and how they're doing their interviews? Yeah, it happens. Um, you know, I won't say that I'm doing it right now because I don't want to make you nervous or anything. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, is. There, there's there's a lot of times where I do interviews and I'm like, God, this is so obvious. They didn't like do any prep and like they have the same 10 questions they ask everybody and it's, it gets a little old. But I mean, I try to be not a dick about it because I also realize that if I started interviewing two weeks ago, I'm probably just going to follow the advice I got from YouTube, which is like, make sure you have questions ready in case you lose your train of thought. And then, of course, people are like, oh, I lose my train of thought all the time. So they use those and they go, oh, this is easy if I just ask everyone the same 10 questions. They don't realize that that's like the worst way to possibly conduct an interview because they're new. So I try to I try to keep that in mind. It doesn't mean it's more fun for me or anything. Yeah. But, what are your sorry? You know. I was going to say, what are your thoughts on the uh, interruptions? Those are yes. fucking oh, yeah. Who does that? We're getting um, to yeah. a bad start here. I'm fucking failing right now. I'm going to, I'm actually going to bounce. <laughs> I'm out guys. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, like the sound effects, right? Like AOL sound like, effects. Boy, and... boy, 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 those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> love them. Love them. Sad trombone. Here and there. You know, it depends. I've thought about throwing some of those in, but I never have a soundboard handy. It sort of depends. Like if you get to FM morning zoo radio show level of sound effects, you're using way too many sound effects. But if somebody says something and it's kind of a downer and it's a funny show, you can do sad trombone and it's kind of funny. Right. Right. Almost the, the overplayed stuff. Yeah. Like I would say one sound effect every 20 to 30 minutes no big deal one sound effect every five minutes you obviously have a shitty show with nothing going on and you're probably gonna get fired yeah, yeah. a lot of filler a lot of good tips of and bobby's actually writing these all down right now so we, <laughs> we, we, appreciate, we appreciate that so why don't you give us um give us a background on your story just from like going from wall street because uh, a lot of the listeners might not know who jordan harbinger is so give us a 30,000 foot high level overview of your background, how you went from nine to five or probably working like 70 to 80 hours a week. Yeah, nine to, to nine or, or seven to, yeah, seven to 12 or. Exactly. Yeah, so, so I started by going to law school, but I didn't go to law school because I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I want to be a lawyer. I went there because I tried to get a job at Best Buy after undergrad and they were like, okay, you're going to be selling CDs. And I was like, no, 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 I can build computers and I have an undergrad degree and I speak three languages or whatever at the time. And they're like, cool, you're going to sell CDs with, with this like 17 year old kid who's a sophomore in high school and i thought this is crazy i'm not gonna what am i doing i have a college degree i have debt more importantly so i just went to law school because i thought well can't get into medical school didn't take any prereqs don't really have a deep desire to get a phd in education or something like that maybe i'll just go to law school which is now 2020 hindsight law school is a catch-all for like overachievers or want to be overachievers it i'd say like a good half to 60 percent of people in law school have no real desire to be a lawyer they're just like eh, i'm gonna go work for a bank i'm gonna go work in corporate and a law degree is a great way to get hired because the job market sucks you know stuff like that 
Right. Uh, or my dad's a lawyer and he really wanted me to do something. So here we are. Uh, and that's kind of why I went. Not my dad was a lawyer, but I just had no, I thought like seven twenty five an hour or go to law school for three years, probably get a six figure job on the way out. That's, that's a better bet. So that's what I did. I went there and I got qualified and then I got a job on Wall Street and I went and worked there. And my first year out of school, it was like starting salary was like $163,000 plus you get a bonus. And I was like, this is great. More than my parents made combined at the peak of their career. It's my first year. You know, this is awesome. Yeah. So, but I didn't love the work or anything. I just didn't think I had any other options. And I remember thinking like, all right, I'm going to get fired from this job because I don't really belong here. Everyone's really smart. Everyone works really hard. I'm decently smart. I work really hard, but like th this is like a top 1% of the, the hardworking smart people. And I was not necessarily in that. The best thing I can do is make myself scarce while I give myself time to figure this out. And then maybe I can avoid getting fired. So I thought, all right, I'm going to work from home if I can. And if I work from home, it'll take people longer to realize that I'm like, a, a dipshit that doesn't belong here. So I started asking how people might work from home and nobody really had a good answer, but there was a partner that was never in the office and he was one of the youngest partners. And I thought, all right, this guy must be working from home and he's young. So like, let me see what's going on here. So I, I remember asking him, how is it that you're one of the youngest partners, but you're never in the office? You know, are you working from home a lot? And he was like, no, I'm generating business for the firm. And that was kind of like, that was news to me. I didn't really understand how you generate business for a law firm. I, I guess I just thought people look you up and like call you when you have a good reputation. I, I had no idea, honestly. Mm. So I, that kind of got me thinking and I was like, I need to figure out how to drum up business for the firm. So I asked him, how does that work? He's like networking relationships. I was like, all right, I don't, I mean, what do you mean? And he's like, you know, people you went to school with and whatever, like keep contact with everyone. I was like, that sounds hard. I don't really get it. And then I thought, all right, I'm going to take networking courses. So I took these networking classes from like Dale Carnegie or whatever. And those were look him in the eye and have a firm handshake. And I thought like, so if I'm not getting a million dollar legal contract every quarter from Goldman Sachs, it's because of my handshake. No, it no way. And I realized pretty quick that while those Dale Carnegie courses were OK, they were super basic. And some guy wearing a sweater vest who's working at the fucking learning annex on Tuesday nights, like that guy doesn't know anything about getting a real corporate deal. He's never probably even had a corporate job or he's, you know, had some he's like laid off from an HR department somewhere in a Midwest Michigan corporate. Like this is not a guy who even gets my world, let alone has any idea how to succeed in it. Sure. And I also kind of realized looking around, I'm not trying to belittle anyone, but I also realized looking around like. Most of the people in these Dale Carnegie classes were like, yeah, I'm working at a car dealership, so they sent me here. Yeah, I'm working at the post office, and my manager said that if I can't learn to run meetings without freaking out in front of 12 people, that I'm not going to get promoted. And I was like, I'm trying to generate multi-million dollar deals on Wall Street. And they were like, okay, bro, what are you doing here? You know, And I just realized like this, isn't, this, this is not the business. So I started learning from first principles. I was like, all right, if people don't like you or know you, how do you generate, how do you get people to know, like, and trust you? And I was reading sales books and taking sales courses. And then I was looking at like what spies were learning and stuff like that. I was like, this is the real shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this type of stuff on your show, but I'm going to. You, you can say things like, you called, can say like, say fuck shit. Yeah. Called much professional is. development. I yeah. feel like that's yeah. fair game, right? You're clear. <laughs> so that was where I went with it. I was like, I need to figure this out for real. And since nobody's got a, the way that this is codified is not like no one's teaching lawyers this. So I'm just going to like make this curriculum. And I started to teach it at law school because they asked me to. And then I realized nobody gave a shit. Nobody was like, I need to learn how to network. There were like five women that wanted to learn this. And all the guys were like, I don't need that. I'm going to go to work at this fancy pants law firm. And I'm brilliant because I work at, I'm going to Wall Street. The women though were like, we're entering a men's world. We need to stick together. We need to develop networking and relationships. Teach us what you have to know. So I started teaching these courses. And then eventually I started teaching them at bars in Ann Arbor because that's where I wanted to meet in the middle of the summer when it was 95 freaking degrees and not in, not like in a non air conditioned room in the law school. Uh, I'd rather do it over a drink. So I started teaching at this bar or these bars and like the group started growing because I started dismantling or deconstructing, as you'd say, people's body language, nonverbal communication, things like that. And then 
after showing up at the same bars with 12 women and now 15 women and now 20 women or whatever the the group size was guys were like hey what are you doing like every day yeah. you're here or every, you know every week you're here with a bunch of women like what what are you doing i see you like looking at people they all they're all like loving it what's up so guys started coming then it was like all right i'm repeating myself i need to have i don't have a textbook i'll record the audio to cds give new people to the group the cd tell them go back and listen to this three hours worth of crap then when you come back next week you'll be caught up right so i did that and then i started losing the cds because guys were like yeah i gave it to my cousin's brother my friend oh my roommates got it and i was like all right now they're 20 bucks and then guys are like great all right they're 20 bucks i need seven i'm like what no you're supposed to bring it back that's why like <laughs> it's a deposit now you're not buying it and they're like okay cool i need seven you know so i started burning cds and i was like all right i'm not gonna get rich selling cds it'll pay for my bar tabs but i'm not getting rich doing this so you know what am i gonna do um and, and then i realized that like this is pretty interesting for people if i'm moving 15 cds a week and my classes are full so i started recording and my friend found podcasting and he's like you should just put the audio up on the internet and podcasting is how you do that I was like, all right, that's a good idea because I'm sick of CDs. So we put it up online and then like the first week that it was up in iTunes, we were getting downloads from Ger Germany, Canada, South Africa. I was like, how are these people hearing about it? So I even said on the show, this is the precursor to the Jordan Harbinger show. I don't really mention them by name. You did earlier, but I don't want to give them any free promo because like, <laughs> I left and sued their ass. Uh, it, but like... <laughs> You know, I started to get downloads from everywhere and I was like, this is really taking off. You know, this is working out really, really well. This is more like a show than it is me teaching this local course. And I just ran with it, you know, like I loved it. I enjoyed doing it. It was like radio. Um, I really had a blast with it. And it was like, read books and talk to smart people. Like, yeah, where do I sign up? You know, at the time it was talk about dating and that's all I cared about at age 26, 27 anyways. So when I moved to New York to work on Wall Street, I kept doing the podcast and then I got picked up by Sirius XM satellite radio. I was doing a show on satellite. So I was like, wow, I actually, I have like a really cool job and I have a law job that pays for everything. So this is a, a really cool kind of thing I've set up for myself here. And I kept doing the satellite radio show and the podcast for years and years and years. Eventually I left my old company and you know, now the Jordan Harbinger show is one of the largest podcasts in the world. So 15 yeah. years to an overnight success. Which is incredible. And I'm sure we don't want to, talk too much about it but you know obviously I, I i did listen to that podcast the art of charm and then you ended up splitting with them and had it like that was at what four million downloads a month something yeah, like it was that like around, it was yeah good memories around prior at the time around four so as you can see like the current jordan harbinger show is much bigger it's at like 11 million downloads it yeah but it's, so, it's like three times the size how's so, that feel it feels pretty good because it's an acrimonious <laughs> split and they tried their best to screw me over in a lot of ways. Right. And all I did was work hard on my own stuff. I didn't have to screw with them at all. And, and, and we see what happened. It's exactly. like, it, and, it, it really is like the best revenge is not to like tell the other team how much they suck. The best revenge is to go and win the Super Bowl and be like, yep, did that without you guys. How's it feel? <laughs> yeah. That's something I wanted to ask you about is, you know, often, you know, the three of us all own our own businesses. And often you hear a lot of times the only reason partnerships are made are to be broken. So how do, how do you feel about that since you kind of went through that experience one time? Yeah, I mean, it depends. A lot of people love having a business partner. It works out really well. They manage their relationships really well. Their roles are clearly defined. Everyone's growing at the same time, you know. But in my case, with, with some of my old partners, it was really clear that people in the company were growing at different rates and I have to be kind of careful because we, you know, we have a legal settlement in place and, and they're very right. much yeah. upset about the fact that they're on the short end of this one. I think, you know, like it's obvious that we did, that I did not fail and that I took the, I took a lot of the team with me when I left, like they're pissed off about all that stuff, obviously. And they should be, um, because right. you know, scoreboard, um, but yeah. like, <laughs> <Love it. laughs> not that I'm feeling my oats or anything, but uh, yeah. eat dirt. Uh, so like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I look at that and I go, you know, I joined up with partners back then because I was like, I want somebody to go through this with me. And I want, you know, people who are, who really understand what we're doing and are passionate about it. But I realize now I really should have just hired these guys because they like at the time we were all worth 50 grand a year. Right. Yeah. And then it was like, 
all right, I'm bringing in all the leads. Maybe I'm worth 150 grand a year. But maybe the other guys are not worth 150 grand a year. Maybe one of them is, but maybe one of them is only worth 50, you know? And then maybe five, 10 years later, he's still only worth 50 or he's worth 75. But maybe me and the other guy are worth 500, which is kind of how it worked out. And it turned out that like me and one other guy were doing like 95% of the work. And then when I started talking with my team more, the people who reported directly with me, I was like, wait a minute, me and my team are doing like 90%. The other guy's doing like five and the other, or whatever the percentages are, maybe my team's doing 70, the other guy's doing 20 and the other guy does like, you know, 10. And I was like, but we're all equal partners. This really sucks. And then it was like, okay, we're going to give you more money here and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And then I was like, okay, well, here's how we grow. And they were like, whoa, 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 you might get paid more, but you don't get to make decisions that, without us. And I was like, that's fair. Let's do this obviously really smart thing that everyone who knows how to run a business is telling us to do. And they're like, nah, I'd rather go to Italy on vacation. And yeah. I'm like, oh shit, we're fucked. You know, like it became really clear that like w when you're in business, and this is, I'll, t I'll stop using my own example here, uh, but when you're in business, you're business married to that person who's your partner. So if one of them spends a shitload of money wastefully, then you, that's your money and you can't do shit about it unless you have an intervention. If one of them is like, my parents were never successful, so I'm gonna self-sabotage all the time and then make sure that we're never successful, that shit is in your house, right? Yeah. Figurative. So like right now, the, one of the reasons the Jordan Harbinger show is at 11 point whatever million downloads a month and my team is really happy and we have low stress and we're like really enjoying the process is because we're all managing things well. We all grow together. I invest in my team. I can take direction without running it through a committee that just wants to buy more, literally buy more shoes, you know, or whatever. When you have other partners, if they're not rowing in the same direction, you know, you're either pulling dead weight, which is what it felt like I was doing, or you might even worst case be rowing in different directions. Like what if one person's like, no, we need to go all in on social media. And you're like, no, podcasting pays the bills and we're not beholden to Google, Google and Facebook as a platform, yeah. which could change tomorrow. And then it's fuck you too bad. You don't own the algorithm. You have no say in this. You know, you might have an obviously good idea. And then they're going, oh, well, you just want the limelight because you're the one that hosts the podcast. And you're like, guys, 90% of our income comes through here. Yeah. We need to expand that channel. Well, you're just saying that because you're in charge of that channel. And then you're just like, okay, so you're just going to not ever okay any of the business ideas that I have to grow. And look, obviously I was right about what would grow the business because I grew in three years what took us 11 years to grow. And I'm 300% larger after three years than, they, than we were after 11. So obviously what I had in mind was the thing to do. Um, yeah. but it, it just took way too much energy and convincing to do that. So you have to be very careful because you are business married to that person and marriage also being a married guy, I can tell you this, you have to grow with your partner. And that means you're doing things where you learn together and you're doing this together. And for me in the business, it was like, I'd take a sales course and then I'd get, take another sales course and I'd take a networking course and I'd craft a product and then I'd end up writing an ebook and then I wrote an, a, a curriculum for this. And then I started taking speaking lessons and doing keynotes. And it was like, the other guys were like drinking at 2 PM yeah. uh, or, or not, not always. I'm just saying like right. their, their <clears throat> personal development was the equivalent of, they took a lot of vacations, you know, they bought a nicer car and I'm like, okay, I didn't buy a new car. I bought a bunch of new skills. And if you compound that over a decade, you look oh, nice. around and you go, what plan? We're not even in the same dimension, like the same solar system where you're generate, like in terms of value you're generating for the company. And I looked at some of the guys that I was, uh, not all, but I looked at one of the guys and I was like, I could replace this guy in like a couple months with a really good coach. Why does he own any part of this company? Like, because he was here early? Okay, fine, that's fair but he should own like 10%, not 40%, you know, or whatever, 33 and a third. And it just didn't make sense. And I started to say like, can I give up something to regain this? And can we do this? And I equalized things and I gave up a lot. And those guys were kind of like, um, you know, not really as interested in that. 
and I've seen this in other businesses as well. I'm not no longer giving uh, just for 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 lawyers who might be listening right now. I'm not necessarily talking about the old company that I was in. I'm talking about uh, a previous company that a friend of mine was in or that I have personal experience with. You don't know because I'm yep. not being specific. Of course. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, you have to be really careful with this because a lot of times people <laughs> hire their friends and they go, dude, this is going to be great. We all love soccer. Let's make a soccer company. 10 years later, one guy's got like an MBA or like took tons of accounting classes and marketing courses and he's running the thing and the other guy still can't fucking figure out the cash register. <laughs> you know, you're you, sorry about know, your look. Yeah. yeah, like sorry about your look. I could hire a 17 year old kid who can figure out how to use the fucking iPad checkout thing. Right. Why do you own half the company? Because yeah. when we were 25, we were both stoked about this. Like I'm the one carrying everything now and that will grind you down. And, and that sort of loyalty only lasts so long, especially when you go, Hey, look, I'm growing. You're not. And they go sucks to suck, bro. See, ya, I'm going to the shoe store. <laughs> like that's not going to work for you long term, And you shouldn't live like that because basically you're beholden to all their baggage, all of their issues, all of their shit that they won't deal with. <laughs> now that's affecting like your kid's future. And yeah. at, at, at some point you just go, yeah, fuck this. Right. And it's a, it's a great story. Obviously it was a, a good learning experience. I'm sure. Good hypothetical and you, story. Yeah. A good hypothetical. hypothetical. And with this hypothetical, like previous <laughs> employer, obviously you hypothetically have to be super, you have to tread lightly just because of potential hypothetical legal ramifications. Right. But hypothetically, would you ever hire maybe another podcast to just go out and just do the shit talking for you? Like, let's say like an up and coming Midwest podcast <laughs> with about 500 Instagram followers. Some bros. You never Hypothetically. know. The, there's, the, you can find value in anything. Um, okay. But, but it is. Bobby, write that is, down. Yeah, write it down. Bobby, you got that? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to remember this, right? Because here, here's the other thing. A lot of people go, oh, never have partners, man. Never, never do it. And I go, all right, I get that. And people go, oh, you must believe, you must be that guy who's like never have partners. I will say personally, I will not take on a partner again in this business. But if I, let's say somebody's like, hey man, let's do a piece of software. I'll code the whole thing. I know all about selling software companies. The last one I exited $13 million. But Jordan, I want you to promote it and I want you to help design it. I'm not gonna go, nah, I don't want partners. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to bring in somebody who I think is going to bring in 50% minimum of everything we need to do to succeed. And ideally it's even more. And then later on, they're like, Hey man, we're selling this thing. I want to buy you out at a really good price. Or like we sold this thing and I'm not going to worry about who did half the work because I'm already loaded, which is like yeah. one of my partners that I have right now is a really good guy. He's sold a bunch of software companies and he's like, let's make this uh, app, connectionfox.com, which helps people remember to keep in touch with and everything. I'm like, great. But every time we talk, I'm like, okay, I can push this out on my show and I can link people to connectionfox.com and I can gratuitously mention connectionfox.com when I'm on other shows uh, over and over again. So that people <laughs> sign up for connectionfox.com. But Not an you know, advertiser what, yet. What was no. that again? <laughs> connectionfox.com. Connectionfox.com. Um, <laughs> And, and like, I can do that, but like this guy has to make the whole freaking product, you know? So, so that to me is a good partner to have because it takes advantage of my natural strengths, takes advantage of his, uh, strengths, but I would never be like, oh, I like this person. Let me give them 15% or 50% of the thing that I've spent like the, all these years creating and is now my stable force. Just like that guy uh, who's my partner on ConnectionFox.com, he's not like, hey, I did this whole thing and I sold a bunch of other companies. Here's my holding company. You now own half because we're making an app together. It doesn't really make any sense. So you can bring people on as a partner when you're younger because you're both passionate about something and you need someone to do a $60,000 a year job and you have $24,000 to pay them. Yeah, then you have to pay them in equity, right? But as you get older... And more established, you have to constantly and consistently, I would say at least annually, reevaluate your partnership and be like, cool, what have you done this year to grow? And if that person's like, oh, um, I don't know, I had kind of a rough year, I'm just coasting, you know, or they just are delusional and they're like, oh man, I've just been waking up early and go to the gym and I've been uh, doing a lot of the stuff for the business. Or you're like, okay, well, you, you've unloaded a lot of trucks. And you figured out how to use the cash register, but like, what else have you done to grow the business? And then you kind of go, huh, every year I've taken a new class, every year I've gained a new skill, every year I've brought us up 10% in revenue. 
this guy hasn't done a whole hell of a lot, you know? And then you can to yourself go, it's time for me to leave this business. And that might mean you buy out your partner, but it also might mean your partner's delusional and thinks that they, he doesn't need you anymore. And then you leave, but maybe that's the best way to do it. Or you might end up in a dispute. What I recommend people do is evaluate every six months to a year. Don't wait like eight years or 10, or in my case, 11, where every month you're like, these guys are not doing anything right. I'm eventually going to have to leave. How the hell am I going to do that? I don't even want to think about it. It's going to be such a mess. Let me put it off. And that's what happened until finally I was like, I'm, I'm over this shit. You know, like I was exasperated. And I would never put myself in that situation again. You know, I would never do that again. It doesn't mean I would never take a partner again. It just means I would never just be like, we're in this together when it's so obvious that other parties don't give a fuck. You know, right. so right. Wake Spe up. speaking of situations you'd never put yourself in again, I heard a story that you were kidnapped twice. And one Correct. of those times was in a fake taxi. And dude, yes. the only time I've ever seen a fake taxi has been on Pornhub. <laughs> so how did that develop and what shook out from it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I won't tell you why I got in the no, um I was living in Mexico at the time and I wanted to go to a bar with a friend of mine and I got into a taxi. And there is an actual fake taxi problem in Mexico. It, it I don't know if it was inspired by what you've been watching online or if it came before <laughs> that. Uh, I think it came before that just given that it happened to me in the year 2000, 2001, can't remember now. And yeah, it must have been 2000. So I got into a taxi and the guy was just like driving me further from my destination, not closer. I was like, all right, uh, this is kind of weird. I, I'm not really comfortable with this. I finally say something and he's like, oh, I need directions. And I was like, oh, this is not good. You know, I'm going to the middle of Mexico City. Every cabbie knows where this is. It would be like getting a cab in Washington, D.C. and saying, I want to go to the White House. And the cabbie's like, don't know where that is. Got to get some directions, <laughs> you know? So I knew I was in something, uh, ended up in a physical altercation with the taxi driver and ended up like escaping and having to move because I didn't know, you know, does that guy know where I live? He's going to come try and find me. Are the police looking for me? So that was kind of a mess. And, you know, there's nothing I really could have done to avoid that. Now I just use Uber, obviously, or another app. But back then, you flagged down green Volkswagen Beetles. I mean, that's what the taxis look like. But there were a lot of people that were either legit taxis that kidnap people or fake taxis that kidnap people. And there were also fake taxis that just drove people to different places and acted like taxis. So you really <laughs> didn't know what you were getting into. My, in fact, when I lived there in Mexico City, uh, when I moved, there was a, a girl that I lived with and her car was yellow. And I was like, this is so weird that you have a yellow car. Like I got it. And she goes, no, it got stolen. And the person used it as a taxi for, I want to say like three years or something. And then the police oh, finally caught the guy, threw him in jail, probably pulled him over for, you know, speeding or whatever. And they were like, oh, we have your car. And it was yellow because he had painted it yellow. Uh, ultimate and side so she hustle. Got her car, yeah, ultimate side hustle. So she got her car back, but it was yellow. And I was like, you don't want to repaint this thing? Or, <laughs> I was yes. like, you know how many times she would be driving and people would be like, Hey, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you should put something like do something with this car. Yeah. Uh, so to switch it back uh, a little bit to the business side of things, mm -hmm. you've been called like the, the ultimate networker, like you've been recognized by Forbes and by Inc. Um, and so we're trying to do that. And I think all of our listeners are trying to obviously develop our network. We're big believers in the law of averages. Are you familiar? The law of averages. I remember yeah. covering that in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be on the roast. I guess we're not doing that topic next week. He's like same 10 questions. The law of averages? Oh yeah. Definitely learn that in third grade, unless you're talking about something no. else. No, no, that's, that's the same one. Yep. Uh, I didn't read up until about high school. So that's probably why I didn't learn it. So, um, but what advice would you give to whether you're like personal networking or maybe a podcast that's just trying to up their level of, of guests to get to a level where you are attracting people at a higher caliber. Oh, oh that law of averages, right? Where you're like, you you become the average of the five people you surround yourself with or something like that. Yeah. That one. Yes. Okay. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking of like the mathematical. I was like, yeah. Oh, I, average numbers. <laughs> oh, I thought you were just, I thought you were just fucking making fun of me. I was no, like, I mean, let's, was. let's, let's, uh, let's do that. Let's assume that. Um, okay. I, I, Okay. So yeah, I do believe in that. I mean, at some level, you know, you, you, 
you do become, you like absorb habits from people around you. There's science behind this. I used to think it was kind of this metaphysical bullshit where it was like, oh, if you're, if you stand near amazing people, you become amazing. It's not really true. It is true that you pick up people's habits, you pick up people's attitudes. So that part is true. But also, you do find that you level up naturally when you, it, you don't have to physically be near these people. You can just be in the arena with these people. Like, I guarantee you that my podcast would not be, the Jordan Harbinger show would be less varied and interesting if there hadn't been a bunch of other really good podcasters that have done similar-ish shows where I'm like, oh, I kind of like the way they do that. Let me take that from them. Or I'm like, oh, this guy's really growing fast. Maybe I need to do more of this. You know, I would just keep doing things the same way. It's the same way. Competition makes you better. So there's that definitely. And yes, there's something to be said for, you know, I don't think my writing is improved because I hang out with Mark Manson, who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Like, I don't think my writing is improved. But I definitely think of doing things differently on social media or in my business because I'm like, dang, you know, somebody from our kind of little niche is just, he wrote the best-selling book of our generation. Like, that's a thing my friend did. That's fr that's freaking cool. Like, maybe I can have something that, like, changes the game for a ton of people instead of just a side hustle. Or, like, maybe if... When I'm when I worked at Sirius XM Satellite Radio, I was like, wow, these are real radio people. Oh my God. And then I would go on their show and I'd go, This guy is not better than me at interviewing. This guy's not funnier than me. Or this guy's not more outgoing or cool or whatever it is. And like hundreds of thousands of people listen to this. Like, I can do this. And I can do it better and more relevant than this 55-year-old guy who keeps making like fart jokes, you know? Like, there's no reason I can't do this. So I started to get really confident. And, and I started to realize, like, I, you know, there, I, I didn't grow up thinking, like, I can be exceptional at anything. It wasn't like I had bad parents. I had great parents. But when you grow up in Michigan, no one's like, one day you're going to own your own business. Because business owners in Michigan were like the Greek family that owned the diner, the Chinese family that owned the Chinese restaurant, the guy whose dad owned a movie theater. Like, that was the rich kid in our area. And I was like, wow, your dad owns a movie theater. That's so cool. Nobody was like starting a scaling internet based business nobody was a creator that made a lot of money doing what they love no, that sh shit didn't even exist in my reality at all like somebody the idea that somebody could do something cool like write a book and get it published i didn't know a single person that had ever done that growing up nobody did that people went to work for ford and that's fine they right. became engineers they became lawyers like that's fine i'm not trying to shit on that at all just to be clear but nobody nobody was an example of like you know, Jordan, you feel unemployable. Maybe you should do stuff you really like and then try to monetize it. My parents didn't grow up like that. Nobody around me was doing that. So it never occurred to me that I could be a business owner and be a successful business owner without opening a restaurant, which was like not something I was into, you know? Why do you feel like there isn't the schooling system doesn't focus on inspiring kids more than educating them? Because you don't really need to do that if you're trying to churn out a consistent product. And a good teacher will do that. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure a lot of teachers are like, what? I do that all the time. What are you talking about? And I get that. But mostly schools are kind of just like, get these kids up to the third grade reading level. If they're already at the fourth grade reading level, cool. They have gifted reading once a month with the other teacher and everybody who's remedial goes to special ed unless they're just kind of behind, in which case they stay in this class. So I remember like very clearly being in kindergarten or first, yeah, I was in kindergarten and my friend Corey was in first grade and we had a split class. So we were in the same room and I was kind of hyperactive. So I grabbed this book from Corey's desk that was called Sun Up, and it was the reading book, and it was like, Sun is up, the dog jumps over the balls, one of those. I just started reading the whole book um, out loud, and I, I remember like kids gathering around because they were like, this is amazing, Jordan can read this whole book, because it they're reading that thing for like three fucking months, right? <laughs> and I read the whole thing in one sitting, and I remember the teacher going like, that's okay, keep going, keep reading, you know? And she was just really encouraging, but then, after I was done, she yes, she moved me up a level in the reading, 
but I was only reading with Corey, and Corey couldn't read the book. I read the whole book. I should have been in at least one or two grade levels above, but she was like, my teacher was like, I can't do that. Yeah. I can't send a kindergartner down the hall and up to the fourth grade classroom to read with the other kids. This is not going to work. Like, I literally got lost on the way there once, and I was, like, crying, and I didn't want to go, and they were like, all right, forget it. You know, like, that's how it was. So th th what schools are trying to do is get everybody – the, they're trying to get the lowest people up to the average, and if you're above average, good for you. We'll try and accommodate where we can, but honestly, we don't have time for the one kid out of 20 that's doing really well. We're just trying to get people through this shit. That's kind yeah. of what teachers are doing. And now there's like 50 kids in a class, right? So like, there's no way the teacher's going to be like, you know what? You're a little bit ahead of everybody. Here's some challenging material. That's what a teacher in an ideal world can do or a school district that has a good ratio and one-to-one -one instruction, but that's not happening. So I don't blame teachers for this at all. My mom was a teacher. I don't even necessarily blame schools for this at all a lot of the time because they're given dictates from whatever the school board and the school board's like, all right, we just want people to graduate so that they're not taking senior year three years in a row or dropping out of high school. Like that's their goal. Yeah. So they're trying to turn churn out a consistent product mm -hmm. so they don't lose funding. That's schools are playing defense. So it makes sense that schools aren't like, you know what? We didn't make sure that Jordan's curiosities are taken care of so that he can flower as a child. Like, they're just like, good, you're not lighting shit on fire? Thanks. <laughs> you know, good. Next. You know, that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so, actually, in line with this, so I have ADD or ADHD or whatever the fuck. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not diagnosed with it, but I know that I have it. I have so many ideas run through my head on a daily basis. And you had mentioned in your uh, interview with Steve Madden, kind of like, hey, every entrepreneur, or probably most entrepreneurs have some level of ADD, ADHD. And so you guys talked about weaknesses and how he hired for weaknesses. And I was just curious for you, you know, do you have that ADD, ADHD, do you think? And what are those weaknesses? How have you dealt with those? Yeah, so I used to think, and I, I, I still may have ADD, ADHD. I was diagnosed with it in college, but... I will say that I was diagnosed by not taking a test and basically telling the doctor, hey, I think I have ADD because I took, and I'm not even kidding, I took my girlfriend's brother's Adderall. <laughs> and and I was like, whoa, I can really focus when I take this shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I must have ADD. <clears throat> now I realize amphetamines are pretty good for focusing whether you have ADD or not. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Yeah. yeah. Like, if you take too much, you probably can't focus. But if you are taking amphetamine and you're like, I am plowing through the studies and I'm retaining everything, you might just be fucking high on Adderall, which is probably what was happening. <laughs> so, like, I think now, I, there was a time where I was like, I wish I'd done this as a kid. I probably would have gone to, like, Yale or Harvard or both, right? But now I'm like, eh, I don't know if I should have been taking that stuff. So I know a lot of entrepreneurs are really... They focus on a lot of diverse things. They're switching from one task to another quite frequently throughout the day. Hopefully they have good systems in place to mitigate losing focus on certain things. And I, of course, we all try to do that. But I, I'm always wary. I'm like, do people actually have ADD or is that something we think we have because we didn't fit in well in school and we don't fit in well in school when we're the type of person that says, why do we do it this way? This doesn't make sense. I bet there's a better way to do it. Let me figure out that way. And the teacher goes, Jordan, Jordan, are you paying attention? And you're like, well, no, not really, because what you're teaching is kind of not that hard or interesting. And also, I'm thinking about this other thing that's three moves ahead of where you were. And no, I lost my train of thought. Like, I remember I used to get in trouble because the workbook would say underline or it would say circle the, the word that fits in the blank. And the teacher would go, great, you have 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is to do this. And I'd go and underline all the words in like three minutes. And I'd be like, great, I'm going to go play. And the teacher's like, what are you doing? Well, what do you want me to do? Just sit at this desk bored? No, are you done with the work? And I'd go, yeah, I'm done with the work. And they'd be like, wow. And they'd go, oh, you underlined all the right words. You didn't circle them. And I'd go, yeah, I know the difference between an underline and a circle, but let me guess, the idea is to select the right word that fits in that sentence, right? So it's a reading and context exercise. I did it. Did I get any of them wrong? No. Yeah, but it says circle and you underlined. And I'm like, uh, okay, whatever. The fu This is totally unimportant. 
And, right? and that's and, when and, you realized you were going to be a lawyer. And that's when I realized, one, I'm probably going to be a lawyer. And two, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing correcting me with this? Like, they're like, he doesn't follow instructions well. And I'm like, yeah, because they're dumb as shit and I'm getting it all right. And so therefore the instructions clearly are not important. Right. Exactly. But again, right, they're, right. they're churning out mediocre product. That's it. They're not trying. It was more important to most teachers that I circled the, the any answer than got all of the answers right in a third of the time it took even the fastest kids in the class to get it. So that to me was like, this is fucking stupid. And I think a lot of people who are quote, supposedly ADHD, they don't even have hyperactivity disorder. Steve Madden definitely does because we edited a lot of like crazy like tangents and stuff. <laughs> but if you can focus on a task and it just so happens to be an intense task and you want to do it faster, the fact that you didn't pay attention in school doesn't mean you have ADD. It just means that you can't sit there with everybody else who's literally average by definition and go through and memorize stuff. And even if you go to college and it's like, Oh, I couldn't pay attention in law school because I was losing my train of thought everywhere. Maybe you're just not good at sitting down and listening to an hour and a half long lecture all day long. Most people aren't. Doesn't mean you're ADHD. Like maybe there's some of that. Maybe you do have that. But I would say you probably, not you, many people who think they have ADD probably don't. They were just cooped up in a bullshit environment for a really long time. And that's not how they learn. Now I learn a ton listening to audiobooks and walking outside. What does that mean? It means maybe I just don't sit still that well and take notes, which is all you do in school, right? Like right. it might just, they don't care about learning modalities in school for most of the time. They yeah. don't care that most people need to physically occupy themselves so they can focus or that some people do. They just think, you know, what's easier for me as a teacher to sit at my desk while all these kids sit at their desks and they write everything down that I'm saying. That's what's easiest for me. They're not thinking Jordan can't focus because he's got a shitload of energy and his mind is working faster than everyone else sitting next to him. They're not thinking about that at all. They don't care. Absolutely. Right? Schools, schools make good employees. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. So. Yeah. And <laughs> and those tests, I remember I took one of those tests for like Adderall or like ADHD or whatever. And I'm, I'm actually glad I didn't go through with it because I didn't end up taking it at least, you know, not for school purposes, maybe a little bit later in college. Right. But, recreational. Yes. Recreational focus more so. At one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Yeah. I really yes. <laughs> sit down and read this calculus. Exactly. So, but it was just like, do you have trouble paying attention? Like sometimes does your mind wander? And I was just like, oh, I know what fucking answer to circle on yeah. this. Like super easy. But I think we're all in agreement where, uh, especially if you can't, like we all, like Brad said, we all own our own businesses. And I think in school, I was just never interested in a lot of that shit. Like even in college, like I just never found anything I was interested in until I got a job and I started reading a book that applied to that job. And I was like, oh, I can get better. Like I can get better mm -hmm. at sales. I can get better at influence. I can get like you. I went to Toastmasters afterwards to learn like vocal tonality and how to structure a speech and all this other stuff. And it's like, that stuff interests me. And that's kind of like how we all got into our given profession and professional development in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, that completely makes sense. I remember working at a movie theater and then working for a security company. And I was like, this is terrible. Or I, sorry, I was like, this is awesome. But then I worked for the law firm and I was like, this is terrible. It doesn't have anything to do with my ability to sit down and memorize information. Now, the law thing kind of did because it was a ton of that. Even as a lawyer, it was like, I'll sit down and do this. But when I had good work, it was interesting enough. It's just that a lot of it was like sitting around and waiting and kind of like crappy dealing with investment banker client type stuff. Now, though, running my own business, I have a million things I have to do. And I, am, I was built for this shit, man. I was built for this, like read books, talk to smart people, market your show, answer fan mail, create good show outlines, create interesting content for the Jordan Harbinger show, create connectionfox.com, 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 <laughs> right? Connect. That's our, fir our first advertiser. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Glad to get that one. Just not on our side. Yeah. Uh, but like, you, you know, doing these things is what I'm like made to do. And looking back, I go, oh yeah, no wonder I felt like, dreading getting employment while I was in school because I thought if this is what jobs are like, I'm f so fucked, you know, but no job is like school. That's the other thing. No job is like school. That's what's d insane to me. Zero jobs involve sitting there and being academic and memorizing things while a teacher lectures and stuff like zero jobs do this. Even law, which is probably one of the more academic jobs in the world you're not necessarily sitting down and listening to lectures. You're like looking for things in databases and you're crafting arguments and writing school. 
had virtually none of that. Like we had a homework like that, but the rest of it was just listening to lectures. It's actually one of the worst ways I can think of to deliver information to young people with active minds now that I think about it. Yep. So uh, we have an OnlyFans inquiry. Uh, and Jordan, just in case you didn't know, because I'm sure you're a big listener of this podcast, uh, <laughs> but just for new people out there, the OnlyFans inquiry is one of the professional development uh, listeners submits a question. Uh, whether it be personal, professional, and how our opinions on how they can get better. So today, Brad, what do we got? The question that we have for you today is, what do you feel is the best style of management for entrepreneurs? And that's from Aaron. So this is tough because it does depend on the business. Like if you're running a footwear store, the best way to manage employees is not going to be the same as if you're running a distributed internet-based business. You know, that that's going to be night and day. So for my business on the Jordan Harbinger Show, I specifically hire people that are not only working for me. I have one employee, it's my wife, um, and she's working for me only, for our business, I guess you would say, and for me, but everybody else is a freelancer that owns their own business, and I do that deliberately. Uh -huh. One, I don't wanna pay for health insurance and things like that, and in California, if you just try and hire a freelancer but you're their only client, you can get super screwed. So I want them to have their own business, have other clients. The other reason is, because I find that a lot of people who work with multiple clients, they're better at communication. They're better at managing their time. They're better at communicating and managing expectations. Um, the other reason is if somebody owns their own business, let's say they get sick. Well, they've got a business with other clients. They probably have the ability to call upon other folks in their organization. Hey, my editor gets sick. I'm gonna give this to somebody else. I'll do the final quality control check, but I'm, I'm down for the count. I gotta give it to another editor. Cool, no problem. But if that person just works for you, they call in sick and you're screwed, right? Yeah. They don't necessarily have anybody else unless you have another person who's also doing their position. So I want them to think of these contingency plans and people who own businesses, they put contingency plans into place. For most employees, the, the contingency plan is that work doesn't get done until they're ready to do it again, which is not great. Yeah. So my writers are all people that have other clients uh, and do things on their own with their own businesses. My editors are all people that have their own businesses. The only person that works for me and only me is my wife. And that I, I think that's been great because now I can manage those people and give them a great degree of autonomy, but also there, the, the other reason I, I didn't mention is if you own your own business, you're constantly looking for ways to make yourself more efficient and grow your skill set and offer more value to your clients. But if you're an employee, maybe you don't do that so much, or maybe you rely on your boss to like give you professional development or, or some kind, or maybe they don't even bother doing that. But if you're on your own and you have your own company, you're streamlining your uh, methods of working, you're doing higher quality stuff, you upgrade your software whenever you can, you learn the new shit so that you're better at the new shit, right? But if you're an employee and you're like, yeah, my boss didn't tell me I have to use After Effects, I'm just gonna use what I've been using for 10 years. Yeah. You might stagnate and I might not even know that about you. So I want, I kinda want constant capitalism going on where people are like, all right, this is now cheaper for me, so my margins are better. Great, but my quality is the same. Good, that means they're working faster. You know what I mean? I want that, I want that ability. So that's, I only hire people that have their own company to work with slash for me. Yeah, I think that's awesome. It's actually something I've never even thought of personally myself. It probably wouldn't work for my business, but it would work for your guys' business. But uh, I, I think that's actually, I would have never even thought about something like that. So that was a pretty good answer for Aaron. For sure. Great. So uh, we're going to have another question, but before I uh, did want to bring this up, Jordan, you're obviously, and you talk about this in your podcast and other people talk about it for you, that you're super generous with your time, mm -hmm. not only because you take the time to come on podcasts, but you're super involved in giving back to the community. Um, we actually got to play a hand in that and that's how we got you on here. Do you want to talk about the giving back that the Jordan Harbinger show is doing? Yeah, sure. So I, I donate a decent amount of money to charity. It it sort of depends on the year. It really does sort of fluctuate. But I the whole show is about helping people, right? Each episode tries to teach a new skill. Fridays, I give advice to listener questions. So it's like an hour of straight up advice because people ask me stuff all the time. Um, but I also donate to causes where I can't necessarily volunteer my time. And a lot of times, look, volunteering your time for a charity is helpful, but I, I thought about this and I asked a lot of nonprofit people or friends of mine that work for nonprofits. I was like, what kind of volunteers do you need? And most of them, not all, like not the local homeless shelter, but most of these nonprofits, they're like, dude, the worst thing 
is when somebody comes in off the street with no training and is like, I have two days and they're all yours. And it's like, great. So now we have to take somebody who is trained and is good at the job and like handhold your ass for 48 hours of bullshit work where you're basically just distracting a useful person for two days mm -hmm. and you're sort of producing at 15% capacity for those two days and then you're gone and you pat yourself on the back for volunteering and then we've just mostly like have a net negative experience. A lot of my nonprofit friends are like, cut a check. Yeah. Then we can hire someone, train them up, do this we can buy the new machine that does everything we need faster we can pay for gas for our employees to come in and you know we can buy a bigger office space whatever it is they just need money these people are running an organization it's just like a business you know if someone goes how can i help your business you go oh well uh if you want to increase our revenue give us some money right become a customer that's how you help a business. The last thing you want is someone goes, no, 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 I really want to help your business. I'm going to fly over there, sleep on your couch. You get to take half a day and show me a bunch of crap that you would normally do in 10 minutes. Then I get to spend three hours trying to do it, not as well as you. And then we're going to do that for weeks and weeks and weeks. That's how I'm going to help your business. Nobody would say yes to that, right? That would be horrendous. So, yeah. and that's what an internship is. It's usually the business is like getting some sort of benefit, <clears throat> but then the person stays for two months and you're like, eh, not our use, most useful employee, but it was nice having them around, right? If you want to do that for a nonprofit, cut a freaking check. Don't show up and ask them to train you for a job that you're not going to keep. That's just as annoying as doing it for a company. Yep. So you can obviously listen and find Jordan on the Jordan Harbinger podcast, and then it's just jordanharbinger.com. And then everywhere on social media, it's at Jordan Harbinger, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And the course, uh, the networking course that we didn't talk about, but oh well, it's at jordanharbinger.com slash course. And it's free. Thousands of people are taking it. I don't collect credit cards or any of that crap for it. And then also, I don't know if I mentioned that I run this site called connectionfox.com. <laughs> is that and one? Did you yeah, guys hear about that? It is a, uh, I already it downloaded is, it. You, you put your, <laughs> cool, it's a website. You put all of your, uh, I already bookmarked it. <laughs> your, <laughs> you put your contacts in there and it'll remind you if it's been like 90 days. Hey, you haven't talked to these guys in a while. So it really helps you keep your network fresh. But yeah, honestly, look, I would love it if people checked out the Jordan Harbinger show. That's why I do. That's why I do what I do, you know, to get that to get that work, those works of art out to the world at large. Right. And by coming on here, you could have up to 500 more followers. So <laughs> <laughs> I know you it's get that. It's in, all been worth it. I know you get that in four <laughs> seconds, but hey, every bit counts, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Jordan, we really appreciate it. Everything, all the content you're putting out, everything that you do, and, and especially today coming on the podcast, man. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It was a lot of fun. Great way to end the day.